Ezekiel 38. <laughs> Surprise. The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets. Also Gomer, with all of its truth, Beth Togarmah, from the far north, and with all its troops, the many nations with you. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hordes gathered about you, and take command of them. After many days you will be called to arms. In future years you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had been brought out from the nations, and now all of them live in safety. You and all your troops and the many nations with you will go up advancing like a storm. You'll be like a cloud covering the land. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On that day, thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme, Gog and Magog and all the rest. You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls, without gates and bars. I will plunder and loot and turn my hand against the resettled ruins of the people gathered from the nations, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, Have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot and carry off silver and gold to take away livestock and goods and to seize much plunder? Therefore, son of man, Ezekiel, prophesy and say to Gog, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In that day, when my people Israel are living in safety, will you not take notice of it? You will come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people, Israel, like a cloud that covers the land. In the days to come, O Gog, I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. Now, I can read on, but you can too. This is a long chapter. The short and long of it is that there is this very familiar prophecy that you've heard me talk about innumerable times. I can't even tell you how many times, but it's probably way more than a hundred. And you can probably name all of these strange names and identify them with the modern places where they actually are. And you know that the end of the story of this prophecy is the all but annihilation of these nations that come against Israel and that it will be attributed to Israel's relationship with God that these things happen. That six out of seven will be destroyed. It will take six months to clean up all the dead. It will take seven years to burn all the weapons. This is a big battle. And tiny little Israel, about the size of New Jersey, will be taking on nations that you can't even count the square miles. It's so vast. Tiny little Israel, with right now today, including the Arab population, whether Muslim or Christian, and there are many Christian Arabs there, is about 10 million people. 
versus the nearly 450 million people of the surrounding nations, half of which is in opposition to Israel and would like to not see from the river to the sea Palestine being free. All that statement means is the annihilation of the Jewish people were back to genocide because what does that mean? You think these people are going to want to live door next door to the Israelis that they oppose? No, it simply means we're going to cleanse the land of all Jews. That's the intent of what you're watching in the news now. Are you seeing Ezekiel 38 and 39 coming to pass? The answer is no. But it's a setup, and you can see it's coming. You can see how fragile the situation is over there. You can see how desperate sometimes the situation is over there. But there are players that are missing from that list. So I want to make sure we're clear on what's going on and why in the world what we're seeing in the news is even happening. And I, I will get into our Bible study afterwards. This is not a long thing I'm going to deal with today. <laughs> I hope. First of all, Israel belongs to God. Israel's people, the Jews, belong to God. They are His covenanted people. This is His covenanted land. And when God makes a covenant and puts His name on it, he cannot and will not ever break it. He is faithful, he is true, and though we have gone back on promises many times and it embarrasses each one of us when we think about those times when we've broken a promise or gone back on something, that God just can't do that. We say, well, yes, he can. No, he can't. Well, God can do anything. No, he can't. There are some things God can't do, and I've told you this before too, and they make God just that much more marvelous. He can't lie. He can't be anything less than he is. He cannot deny himself. He cannot be anything less than holy all the time from eternity past through eternity future. I love what God cannot do, and I love what he can, and also what he told us he will. The Jews belong to God. They are His people. They always will be. Israel belongs to God. For as long as this earth exists, Israel belongs to God and to no one else. It can pass into other people's hands. It did for a really long time. Back and forth and back and forth. The Romans and then the, the Muslims, the Arabs, uh, and then uh, the Ottomans, the Turks. Uh, and then you have the British and all of that passed into different hands, but it never changed the fact that this was always what we refer to as the Holy Land because it's always been known somehow this land belongs to God and belongs to God's people. Israel's enemies, they're in Ezekiel 38. Gog and Magog. Those would be referred to, well, there's a lot of things you can say. Well, it's got to be Russia. Look at it through their eyes. They had no concept of Russia back in those days. So God is painting a picture of what the northern enemies of Israel that will invade from the north, the big one, Gog and Magog, will actually look like. Back in those days and for a really long time, there was a group of people to the north that even scared Alexander the Great so badly that by the time he got to Pakistan, he built a wall at a river's edge to wall these people off because he was afraid they might invade and upset his conquest. You can call them many different things, Scythians and Sarmatians and what have you. And the bottom line is, they were considered by the folks of Ezekiel's day as the northern barbarian hordes, people you never wanted to mess with because they could take you down if they ever got organized. And this intimates that someday they will be. 
This fits the shoe very well for Russia today. I reluctantly will ever do this is that. But this one, the shoe does fit. But the other names of the places, Persia and, and uh, 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 Kush and Put and all of these, Persia is who? Iran. S put. Uh, Kush, rather. Sudan. Libya is Put. And then you have all these other names, Beth Togarman, Gomer, and all of these things. They're all sections of the country of Turkey. First of all, what's happening right now, the Russians have contributed to, but they're not heavily involved in because they're occupied right now. They have a lot going on in Ukraine. They're trying to really wipe it out. And secondly, if you follow the news, like on page 16 of the old newspapers, whatever those are anymore, you have massive flooding happening in the south of Russia in places like Kazakhstan and whatever. There's a huge natural disaster going on that you barely read about, but you can catch here and there on sites that are way back, a few pages on CNN or something like that. So they're busy right now, and they're just barking a little bit, but they have been feeding into this for sure. Other nations that we just read that are mentioned, Sheba, Dedan, Tarshish, whatever Tarshish is. But what's also interesting is Sheba is Arabia. We'd call it today Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is in a really tough spot because Iran considers Saudi Arabia a big target. They want Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia has oil. It has the southern approach of the Persian Gulf which they have all the northern approach. They want the whole access. If they do, they control the world's oil supply. And it has Mecca. And even though the Persians, or Iran, is Shiite, which relies on a top-heavy leadership type of a thing, an ayatollah, a supreme leader, they hate the Sunnis, which vastly outnumber the Shiites, and they work more on well, kind of a city-state basis, you might say. They have a lot of different leaders, imams and, and what have you, but no ayatollahs. And these two factions hate each other, and they are vast. So, Saudi Arabia, years ago, has given Israel permission to overfly their country should they ever want to attack Iran. Does that tell you who Israel's friends are? Hmm. And even though Saudi Arabia has been balking at signing any sort of a treaty with Israel, as Gordon and I were talking today, he used a really good term. They do have kind of a, a, a sort of a backdoor handshake that we will cooperate together because truly in the old Middle Eastern fashion, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Saudi Arabia is definitely an enemy of Iran. The Abraham Accords uh, during the time of Trump that were signed actually was the thing that Iran hated the most because it identified Iran as the great devil in the Middle East and not Israel. It shifted the focus because all the Arab countries were, with Iran's help, focused on Israel to annihilate the Jews when in fact they learned suddenly that if, they, if Israel has your back, you're in a really good position, and Iran wants to take you over anyway. They would love to overthrow Jordan, overthrow the king of Jordan, and take over Jordan. Jordan has some harsh rhetoric that they spout every six months or so against Israel because it's expected of them to do so. But Jordan's borders to Israel are still open, and flights go back and forth between Israel and Jordan. What does that tell you? They're buddies. At least they have that backdoor handshake. And what happened yesterday with all those missiles being fired and what have you, the drones, the missiles, uh, the cruise missiles, the ballistic missiles, there was a lot of things going on there. Most of them didn't get to Israel, and a lot of them were shot down over good old Jordan. The Jordanians did it because they're at high risk, and even more so now than ever, from Iran's wrath. And then there's Tarshish. And we have no idea where that was, but it's somewhere in the west, apparently. 
So we'll just leave that alone. It'll become clearer in the future. Among the other things, countries that are in the area, in the region, not mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Egypt. Egypt has been an asset to what's going on. And of course, Jordan. Not mentioned at all. So you can see things are positioning themselves. But not everything is moving. But when they announced last night, which was expected, I expected it, I just didn't want to see it, and I assume neither did you, that Iran had launched at least 300 uh, weapons of various sorts at Israel, that you just pray and hold your breath and see what's going to happen next. Well, here's the summary of what's going on from my sources, which came in this morning. Uh, first of all, there is a fellow who actually spoke here once about, oh, I'm guessing 20 years ago. It's been a while since he's been here. But he is a historian, Israeli historian. He lives in Israel. He's also a tour guide. I've never had him guide for me. But he brought up a point where it's being said all around. Our country, other countries, our president, other presidents and prime ministers are saying that we want to avoid a regional war. Let's put things into perspective for a moment. Regional war in the Middle East needs to be avoided. I'm sorry, you've had one for about 40 years. As a matter of fact, as Ronnie put it, this other guy, I know of many Ronnies over there, he said, you want to avoid a regional war? Quote, it's too late. There is a regional war in the Middle East. When Israel is attacked from Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Gaza, and Iran, it's a regional war. That's what's been going on. The news just kind of splinters it out so you can focus only on Gaza or Syria or Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's all of the above. And then he goes on to say, it, the civilized world needs a decisive victory. That is his, his uh, military comment coming in there, that he really does support Israel going in and just take out the threat. Now, you say, well, is that where we stand? No, we stand with what we read in Ezekiel. Got to stand with the Scripture, always. Let the Lord take care of this, but do we support Israel? It's God's Israel. We support God, we support Israel. Do I support what the Israeli government does? Not all the time. Sometimes they do some goofy and stupid stuff. But the government is different than the land. And the Jewish people are different than the government, even though the government is run by Jewish people. We support the Jewish people, God's people. We support the land of Israel, God's land. Proxy war. That's what's going on. I've used that term before. You've heard it in the news, if you were watching any news yesterday at all, a lot. A proxy war, which simply means that there is someone who is a puppeteer pulling the strings on a whole bunch of puppets to do the work for them. That's what Iran has been doing ever since 1979. The combatants against Israel are Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Jihad, PLO, the Houthis, or Houthis, if you want to call them that down there in Yemen, um, Iraqi sympathizers, Syria, and lots of other small groups and big groups. Most of them, all of them, uh, Islamic fundamentalists or empowered by Islamic fundamentalists and fanatics. Prior to 1979, it was simply the fight that was going on against Israel, the uh, uh, 73 war, the Yom Kippur war, you have the uh, uh, 67 war, the Six Day War, and several other uh, wars that went on, were countries and groups of Muslims that could not get well organized, bent on the, pushing the Jews into the sea, which read genocide. They didn't want them around. Well, we'll move them out somewhere else. Who's going to take them? You couldn't take less than a thousand people off the St. Louis during the, as the Holo at the outset of the Holocaust, as a bunch of Jews were looking for a place to settle anywhere other than back in Germany, 
and nobody would take a thousand Jews. You've got at least seven million in that country now, and you want to move them out? Where are you going to put them? Who's going to take them in? This is why it's said today on the news and by commentators in Israel that Israel is in an existential battle. In other words, it's not a philosophical battle. It's a battle for their very existence. They have to win this war. 1979, something happened over there. The Shah of Iran got cancer. He was deposed and he took refuge in Egypt. Uh, another person who was known as the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was exiled to France, moves back into Iran, takes over as the supreme leader and the Islamic Revolution. There we go. <laughs> the Islamic Revolution begins. And what you see Iran today as is what's been growing out of that Islamic Revolution under the Ayatollah Khomeini. And his goal is to rule the Middle East as an absolute supreme leader and to annihilate Israel and the Jews. The Ayatollahs, even though he's dead, the series of Ayatollahs, have bought into this. The Iranian presidents, who have been elected by the people, follow the supreme leader as an absolute dictator, even though the presidents that you see that come and go in Iran are elected by the people. Please also be reminded, and I've said this before, that it is highly likely, and the statistics are very hard to find, that most of the Iranian people do not like this arrangement. And one of the biggest revivals going on in the world today, Christian revivals, is happening in Iran. So don't judge by the group. You can judge basically by the politicians and by the religion at this point. But since 1979, this proxy war has had the same goals. It's fed and fueled by Iran to wipe out the Jews. Now, there are, just in case you're wondering, tours going on in Israel right now, just like the ones that I lead. You say, you're crazy. No. Got word from another friend of mine, uh, his name is Shmulek, or Samuel, who wrote, upon learning of these developments, talking about last night in the news here, we immediately contacted our tour leaders to confirm the safety and well-being of our guests. We were reassured to hear that many were unaware of the incident until morning, having had an undisturbed night. Activities and tours are proceeding as scheduled with no disruptions to our planned itineraries. That tells you the mood in Israel is a little different than what it appears in the news because remember, if the news can get us to get angry or panicky or something else, we go back for more and we buy their sponsors' products. It's all about the bottom line. So within all of this, how close are we? I don't know. But I can tell you one thing. We are a lot closer than we were. I also want to warn you about something especially with the events of last week, the eclipse. <laughs> you do know that we have two of those every year, at least, sometimes more than that, because of astronomical motions that are entirely predictable mathematically. They're not surprise events, but they do raise something within people, within the church, that it is an abomination before God superstition. And it is truly superstition that is not of God, but cheer-led by Satan. Because superstition is allowing something that is not God, not of God, to have power over you, your life, your movements, your intentions, the direction of your life. How many people have been led by horoscopes. These are planets moving around the sun. They're big, dumb objects of rock or gas. I'm being moved by where a giant ball of gas is placed against the background of stars. Boy, I'll tell you, that's a trap of Satan. 
And then there are the eclipses. Well, what about the moon turning red at the end times? Yeah, those are atmospheric effects of the disasters of God's wrath going on in this world. It's very clear. Read the context. I've noticed something that I suppose that we're supposed to have been raptured by now if the rapture date setters were correct. Or maybe it's early next week. Well, let me tell you something. If they're right, nobody's going to care and we're all going to be happier for it. But I will say this, when they are wrong, I can guarantee one thing that these people will not do, and that's apologize and never do it again. Because all they are are meddlers with the church, with God's people, to their own ends. And they prove it when they won't say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I will never do this again. Besides, they've usurped the authority of Jesus, who he himself stated, I don't even know when I'm coming back. And when somebody tells me they know more than Jesus, and they usually say, never mind what he said, that is blasphemous. I'm using big words this morning, and I mean what I say. So don't listen to these people. Flee from them. Don't listen to them. That's the deal. So here's the bottom line before we jump into <laughs> our now longer study uh, recap of the seven churches, uh, which means longer not today, but longer I've got to extend it a week. <laughs> I, the news just does that, doesn't it? But here's the bottom line. With all that's been going on and you watching in the news and your concern for Israel is very legit. Pray for these people. Pray that they'll wake up and know that Jesus is the Messiah because Israel is full of people that reject Jesus as Messiah. The Arab population of Christians far outnumbers the Messianic population of Christians in Israel, which is a tiny minority. <coughs> tiny minority. And they are usually persecuted. Jews who believe in Jesus as the Messiah by extremist Jews who don't want anything to do with Jesus the Messiah. Most of the Jews in Israel could care less one way or the other. But they all need the Messiah. Jesus came first to the Jew, then to the Gentile with the gospel. That's the deal. And that's the most important thing. But what you're seeing happening now in the news, as alarming as it is, and it can go any which way, Israel is bound, pretty much, honor-bound and what have you, to attack and retaliate. That's the nature of the Middle East. As you know, the great motto of the Middle East is it, it started when he hit me back. So that's what they're doing. But you can see how serious this is. You can see where this could go. You can see how this could stack up really fast to look like Ezekiel 38 and 39, to be Ezekiel 38 and 39. And when these things happen, we start looking around and looking at the news and listening to what's happening and saying, could this be it? You know what the answer is? Yes, it could. And if you've been putting off giving your life to Jesus, if you've been putting off following him with your whole heart, I believe God is reminding us again in the last 24 hours that it's closer than you think. And you can't afford to wait, even if nothing else happens for a thousand years. And I don't think it's going to be that long. Now, that's my opinion. But everything in the news, everything in the world, my contacts with Israel, and not only Israel, but Jordan and Turkey and places like that, it tells me otherwise. But God only knows. And God only has the plan and the exact timing of it. If you're waiting for something to happen before you say, well, I need to get serious with God, you are making a horrible mistake right now. The world needs Jesus now. He needs, the world needs His love, His gospel, His grace his message, his life, now. And we are the receptacles of that, that he intends to fill up with himself that living water to overflowing so that other people drink from 
of him from you, from us. That's the church, and that's us. Which is why I think it's, well, in my mind, very convenient that these events happened yesterday into this morning because Jesus, in Revelation 2, begins seven letters to seven churches, which we've already gone through with a fine-tooth comb a couple of years ago, to make sure that the church is in good shape and stays that way. And it's very interesting, if you haven't put two and two together, he puts these letters at the beginning of the book of Revelation that reveals God's wrath and Christ's second coming in the end times. There's a reason these letters are there. Well, they're for all the different church ages. I went over this before. I mentioned it actually a few weeks ago before, um, before Resurrection Sunday we talked. And with all of that, that even so, the churches must be in shape during the last days. Jesus is coming back. And if you didn't know, forthcoming now, I am pre-tribulation as far as the rapture is concerned because with all the death and devastation and the targets hung on anyone who's Messianic, Jew or Gentile during the last days, the last seven years of earth's history and all the people that will be killed for their faith, martyred for their faith, if the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, it will be the great non-event of history. There's no one left to rapture. Jesus is coming. Let us be found doing what he told us to do. Taking care of one another. Preaching the gospel to the world. And loving the world the way he loved the world. The world was lost, but he loved the world. God so loved the world. Well then, so should we. Because we have the Jesus that saves them. The only one. So here are these letters. These seven letters. And it begins here in chapter 2 of Revelation. And I'm just going to read the first letter. I'm going to summarize, if we even get that far, the next two. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, John, church in Ephesus, you know these people, you lived in Ephesus. You are associated with this church. He's probably the overseer of this church. Uh, as far as the overseer of the overseer, you might say. We would call that man, by the way, a bishop, even though that's really not Calvary Chapel vernacular. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. This is Jesus. And walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is Jesus. Read just, just a, a few verses prior to this. You'll see it. Jesus speaks. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. There are details there that if you weren't here when we went through this chapter in Revelation in this particular letter, you can go online to YouTube or to the church website and you can either listen or watch the study that we did about two years ago in this subject where I covered all the details. Right now, I don't want to cover all the details. We have to move. And I want to get to our next book, which will come someday. But these seven letters are more pertinent than ever. 
Are they different epics in, in church history? Maybe, but I don't think so. They're for all the churches. Symptoms of things that happen to any church and can happen to every church if we're not very, very careful. And things that are inevitable that will happen to churches, suffering and what have you. It has nothing to do with being careful. It has to do with the fact that since you've been careful, some people aren't going to like it. And they're going to put your feet to the flames. He gave us these words that we would heed His words and not be caught off guard, sleeping or seduced by the world or by empty trends in the church or by complacency or lacking love or worship or prayer. That no matter what happens next or however long God takes to send His Son to go get His bride, we have these instructions from the Lord, warnings, threats, and blessings. As I said before, these are written, all seven letters, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And the angel, who is that? As we said before, most likely it's the pastor. Angels were messengers. And it's the overseer of the church, the direct overseer, the pastor. So this letter, all these letters, are written to pastors. There are pastors in this room, and there's me. And looking at this, it's staring back at me like a mirror. What do you see in this? To any pastor, anyone in ministry that listens to this, listen carefully. Because it's written to the messenger. The messenger first, and then the messenger gives the message to the church. So it's written to us too. You too. And oh, think of it slightly different than Americans. When we hear this, we ask, how does this apply to me? Don't ask that question. Ask the question, how does this apply to us? Because that's to whom these were written. The one me in all of this is the pastor. And the pastor some of these guys are being praised and others rebuked. So in the immortal words of Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone, <laughs> so submitted for your consideration, the Lord speaks to my angel and my church in Ephesus. You read it. You heard the letter. You heard what Jesus said. What did he say? Let me show you a little about, bit about Ephesus here. I don't think we're moving here. Is this right? Nope. Okay. I have a, actually have a PowerPoint this morning. Let me show you. This is an artist's conception of Ephesus. This is what they think it looked like down the main street that led from the upper city to the lower city. Beautiful place. In fact, the street that you see there, if you look to the left, in the colonnades over there, they even captured something that you can see today that the, under the colonnades, all the way down to the bottom of the street, where the great library of Celsus was built after the time of Paul, but it was built in, in that interval, that entire street is one very long, about a third of a mile, mosaic road. Beautiful thing. But it was a very, very important city, and it was a big city. I don't think I'm working too well here. So, okay, let's try it again. Uh, this is what that same road looks like today. It's a ruin. In the background, you can see a great grassy area, agricultural fields and trees. That used to be a huge port. It's silted up for six miles away from the city, so you can't even get close to it anymore by sea. Let's go to the next one. This is what it looks like today. At the bottom of that road, there's the facade, not the whole building. The whole building was never reconstructed of one of the three great libraries in the world. There was the Library of Alexandria, the Library of Pergamum, and the Library of Celsus. And that was the Library of Celsus. Fell down in an earthquake. But you see the street going off to the right, up towards the corner. That heads off to the great theater there in Ephesus. Let's go to the next slide. And I'll tell you about this in just a second, but the great theater is where that riot took place over in the book of Acts. Remember, great as Artemis of the Ephesians and all of that, because Paul wanted to address them. And this, of course, is also in Ephesus. This is called the Basilica of St. John. It's a Byzantine church. 
Byzantine Rome, that's late Rome. It's after the time of Constantine. Uh, after 320 AD is a good round number to call Byzantine times. And that church was put in there because that little square right there is believed by many, hard to prove, to be the grave of the Apostle John. This is where apparently, maybe, he was buried. So I'll leave that picture up for now. Ephesus. You're good at loving others. But Ephesus, even the world could do that the way you do it. You see, you forgot it was about me, Jesus said. Ephesus, I know your good deeds. You got hard work. You got perseverance. You're doers. And also, you're protectors. You don't tolerate wicked men. Somebody bad comes into the church, you don't let them rip the church off. You don't let them doctrinally rip the church off. You protect that part of it. You've tested people who claim to be apostles. Hey, I'm an apostle. I'm from Jesus. <laughs> you tested them. No, no, you're not. You found them false. And you persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. You do all these things. But you forgot it was about me. It's very unfortunate that around this world, in America and other places in the world, but it's places like Europe and what have you, churches are really good at being churches. But a lot of them aren't so good at looking like Jesus because they're good at the benevolence projects. They're good at the taking care and the doing. And Jesus commends the churches for that. It's okay. That's good. I love to see that. But you forgot one thing. It's about me. Your love that you lost somewhere along the way, you got so busy, it fell out of your pocket on the road, and you never thought to go back and look for it. It's my love for others through you, through this church. And you get your love by loving me. Jesus is telling them. Apart from me and my love, he would say to them, your charitable achievements are no better than the handouts provided by your local pagan temples. And they did that too. Paul wrote over in 1 Corinthians, and even though Paul is not John, and John wrote Revelation long after Paul wrote, and long after Paul was dead, I think there's a handshake here too. 1 Corinthians 13, you know it well. Chances are, if you were married in the last 30 or 40 years, it was read at your wedding. Paul said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, I'm doing real spiritual stuff. Wow, real spiritual stuff. But I have not love, agape love, God's love, the love that does for others, from God to others, and he gets glorified. Then I'm only a clanging gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, ooh, can fathom all mysteries, oh, and all knowledge, ooh, wise and smart, insightful. And if I have faith, I can move mountains. But I have not love, I'm nothing. Isn't that what Jesus just told them? If I give all I possess to the poor, benevolence, oh. And what benevolence? All I possess. And even surrender my body to the flames. I martyred for it. Well, martyrdom was considered something that was agonizing, painful, hurtful. You didn't want it to happen, but when you did, you know you were doing the right thing anyway, even though it was, it was horrible. I could do all of that, but if I have not love, I gain nothing, Paul said. What's that look like? Hmm. Love suffers long and remains kind. You might read it, love is patient, love is kind. Literally, love suffers long. That's usually at the hand of others, by the way, because of the context. And stays kind. Doesn't envy, doesn't boast, not proud, not rude, not self-seeking, others seeking, God seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps, ooh, it keeps no record of wrongs. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Oh, it's not easily angered, excuse me, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices, rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and never fails. It doesn't die. It's always there for us. But we, once again, are the ones who God pours this out on others. What would you rather be known for in the church? What would you rather be known for as a Christian? Just to be known as a Christian? To be known for the bumper stickers you may have on your car? I don't put bumper stickers, Christian bumper stickers on my car because sometimes I don't drive so well and I don't want people cursing Jesus because of my bad driving. <laughs> Funny, you think I'm joking. But what would you rather be known for? And this is a very interesting question. Let's say this is the letter to the church in Greenwood. What would you like to be known for here, church? For all that we do? Or for who we're like? Because if we're known for being like Jesus, then all we do is a given. It happens. And Jesus gets the glory. But otherwise, if we forget that, that we love him first, and because he loved us, we love him, we love others. Whether they are Christians, but starting with the household of God, the Bible tells us, or others who don't know the Lord, people need to know and should know through our lives. It's because of Jesus we're doing this, not because we're Calvary Chapel, not because we're the church in the neighborhood, and churches do that sort of thing. Jesus does that sort of thing. Well, how do they know that? Because you just can't shut up about it. Uh, somebody once said, Christians really ought to be a bunch of fanatics. Well, what's a fanatic? A person who won't change his mind and can't change his subject. I thought, that's pretty true, isn't it? Even though it was meant to be an insult. I thought, no, that's pretty true. What is this love? Well, I just told you part of it, but let me tell you this one. Paul, once again, writing in a letter to the Ephesians, the same church that Jesus is dictating this letter to, probably 40 or 50 years later. Paul wrote this over in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, Ephesians, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. We're family, Ephesian church. We're family. We all derive our name from him. I might be in a prison. You may be way over there. We're still family. And we derive our name from him. We're known by his name. By the way, that's the way families functioned in those days. See, I've told you this before, and it's really hard to get through our heads because we are Westerners. We are rugged individualists. We conquer. We're the, the John Wayne, Annie Oakley types, you know, that sort of thing. But over there, in that world, an individual represented the entire family. They were not an individual that came out of a family, they were inseparably attached to that family, just the way the tentacle of an octopus is attached to the whole animal. Never separate, or it dies. I pray that out of his glorious riches, Paul said, his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you, church, with power through his Holy Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, Church of Ephesus, Church of Greenwood, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, rooted and established in the love of Jesus. It didn't fall out of your pocket moved into your heart. Together with all the saints, not just you, all, Christians everywhere, to grasp 
how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That was Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, and as you can tell, it's all about the love of Christ filling our lives because Jesus is there. God is love, and He is God. And may He, in all His ways, overflow us into whatever we put our hands to. May we look through the lens of His eyes at one another and then at the world around us, not our interpretation of it, what he's already written for us. This, it seems, is what they forgot. Interestingly enough, that first love was detailed decades earlier by the Apostle Paul. So how do you sum this one up before we move on to the next one? We'll do one more and we'll be done. Someday. It's as if Jesus is saying, and I'm not quoting him, so please take it as my own personal supposition. But saying something like this. But if you pastor and you congregation, remember that the great, remember that great pinnacle that you once stood atop and from which you fell. If you, pastor and congregation, repent from that place that condition that you should never have found yourself in. If you, pastor and congregation, just return and love me like you did when we first met, then I'll give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, which you know all about because we covered that a few months ago. And then he says, let him who has an ear to hear, let him hear. In other words, Listen up. Listen up. What was the final outcome? What was the fate of the church at Ephesus? What was the final outcome of Jesus' rebuke and warning to this church? It went on for a long time. You can tell by what you see on the screen. It went on for a long time. That church was late Roman. There was a church there for a long time. But as you can see now, there isn't any more. It's in Seljuk, and there's nothing there. Uh, here's the epilogue. I'm going to read from a little chunk of history. Just a second. Just follow me on this. In the years following the departure of the Apostle Paul, the church in Ephesus grew and flourished under the leadership of such men as Timothy, Timothy, and John. The power and name of Jesus continued to be held in awe. And the city became a vital Christian center in the early years of Christianity. By the end of the first century, however, the Ephesian church had become institutionalized and thus mired in its own religiosity. Jesus declared to the Apostle John that the Ephesian church endured well the persecution of Rome under Domitian, he was a bad emperor, and faithfully exposed false teachers but they had also forsaken their first love. The Christians had become in a very real sense like the pagans, excelling at religious duty, but failing at demonstrating the matchless otherworldly love of Jesus Christ. Thus, the pagan pilgrimages to the temple of Artemis continued year after year after year as they had done for centuries. And the people remained in awe of Jesus Christ, but no more so than Artemis. That was the fate of the Ephesian church and why that is still a ruin. Jesus, with his letter, has given us the mercy not to make the same mistake. One more, shorter one. Submitted for your approval. I can just hear Rod Serling saying that. Submitted for your consideration. My angel and my church in Smyrna. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first 
and the last who died and came back to life. I know your afflictions and your poverty, and yet you're rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. That's a scary statement right there. What if I just said, by the way, everybody, I have news for you. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. What? What? I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. That's a while. Faith, but be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. As you know, that's the great white throne judgment. And that is followed by hell. Let me go to the next one here. Jacob, I may need your help on this. Can we go? Yeah, I will. I'm sorry. It's just not connecting well today. This is Izmir. Modern Izmir with ruins in front of a very modern building in the background. Izmir is in Turkey. It's on the coast. It's north of Ephesus. It used to be called Smyrna, named after um, uh, myrrh, this perfume. But that perfume was used in pagan rituals. So it's named after an intensely pagan thing. And even though it was given to Jesus, it was used in pagan rituals in that city because they wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is another picture of the ruins of, of Smyrna. They really haven't excavated much. They're not really impressive ruins, are they? The whole city is gone. Go to the next one, please. I want to leave it right there just for a second. The people in Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, the pastor in Smyrna, they worshipped and they acted like Jesus. You want that? Do we want that? Do I want that? Yeah. What Jesus told the people in Smyrna, you're going to pay a price for it. You already paid some. You're going to pay a lot more. You're not paying your admission to heaven. It's just this is what happens if you decide, I'm just going to live for Jesus. He's mine. I am his. I worship him. I love him. I will do what he says. You would think that everybody would like you. When the Holy Spirit came on the early churches, Jeremy has been teaching in the book of Acts to the guys on Thursday morning that the early, very early newborn church received the approval of people in the city. They were well liked because they did great things. But now it's out among the Gentiles, out among the pagans. And hostile Jewish sects, not all, but some, that were bound and determined to put out the light of this Nazarene sect that would be the Christians that they didn't fully understand and who were letting Gentiles come into the faith without becoming Jews first. And so they got in trouble with the pagans and even with their own fellow religious people. They got slammed for acting like Jesus, just like Jesus said was going to happen. In fact, as you know, over you've read the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when people insult you, Jesus said. He's talking to his disciples, the people who follow him with their whole hearts. Happy are you when people insult you. I'm not too happy when people insult me. I'd wager a guess neither are you. He said, happy are you. Uh, oh, by the way, somebody pointed something out about that word, blessed, that it's an idiom that we say blessed, oh how happy, makes us happy, but really it would be best translated from their minds as they read the word as, this is your happy place. That puts a little different emphasis on it. Your happy place is when people insult you and persecute you and falsely, not truthfully by the way, falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Here's the caveat because of me. People will say and do all kinds of evil against us 
But when it's strictly and specifically because of Jesus, that's your happy place. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Rejoice. Rejoice. Be glad. Whoopee. Because great is your reward in heaven. This life is a blip in all eternity, not even that when you talk about forever. For in the same way Jesus encouraged them, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you get persecuted for following Jesus and loving Jesus, you're in really good company. You're in company with the prophets of the Old Testament. The ones who were persecuted for doing God's work and saying God's words. Blessed, this will be your happy place. Because Jesus will, will, will bless the persecuted. That's what he does. Persecuted. This church is persecuted because the pastor and the people remain faithful to him no matter what came at them. They were persecuted because the pastor and the people endured terrible suffering for staying faithful to him no matter what came at them. What is that? He told us, you just read it. Affliction. Ooh, don't like that. Poverty. No, we're Americans. We really hate that. Slander. Don't like that. Persecution. Oh, and future persecution guaranteed. Oh, even more than that, satanic threats from those you thought to be allies. And even death. Oh, and by the way, one more thing is guaranteed. The crown of life laid on them by Jesus himself, followed by everlasting life. What you're looking at in that picture is a church called the Church of St. Polycarp. In that part of the world, that church is not old. It's only about 200 years old. To us, you know, 150 years is like crazy. To them, that's a new building. The Church of St. Polycarp is Catholic. It does also have a Greek Orthodox chapel built into it because the area is largely more Greek Orthodox than it is, than it is Catholic. But the doors are always open in this place. It's not built on any archaeology. In fact, it's built on landfill because ancient Smyrna, their port, also like Ephesus, silted up. And this is built on that part of it. So it's not even built on the original city. But it's the only functioning church in Izmir. Now go to the next slide. This is an odd picture. This is the inside of the church. Um, I'm the guy in black to the left of the other guy in black. And this was a group that we went to Turkey with a couple of years ago. The guy to my left, your right, is an archbishop. And he personally told me after I was given permission to quietly teach a Bible study about the church in Smyrna, in his congregation, in his church, to our group sitting in the pews. He simply said, I love it when people come in here and teach the Word of God. And I went, I like this guy. <laughs> this is the only known functioning church in Izmir. It's the only one of the seven churches that still exists today. All the others are gone. And it's not because of the Turks or the Muslims or anybody else. I think it's God just saying, i got to pull that lamp because it just doesn't look like me. Well, I don't know what happened in the history of this church going back further than talking to this gentleman. But between the time that Jesus spoke to this church, and that there were horrendous persecutions that broke out in Smyrna against the Christians because they refused to worship Caesar. They refused to paganize in any way. But they continued, because Jesus didn't rebuke them on any point, in the love of Christ. 
They continued following Christ, worshiping God, sharing the gospel in whatever manner they would share it, and doing good for one another and others outside the church. And they paid the price. When we think, or start to think, that if we get too outgoing in our society and our culture here in America, we stand a strong chance of getting protested or canceled, the people in Smyrna would laugh, saying, what are you talking about? That's nothing. The hell that they went through that at the end caused them to obtain heaven. They didn't earn it. Jesus bought our salvation. And no work and nothing else can get us there except him. Remember that. But we walk and we live for Jesus. And I'm going to press the pause button here. Because this is the fate of the church in Smyrna. It's still there. It's, I, I wish it was a Calvary Chapel. It's not. But I'm glad it's there. And it's remained there. But as you'll see next week, the next church we deal with had the same problems as Smyrna, but instead they wanted to soften the impact of the persecution. And they opened the door to compromise. And they're not there anymore either. We'll look at that one next week. And we'll also look at Thyatira next week. I hate to stall things out, but we're going to stop right there. And so, Father, help us to remember what you've said here today by your Spirit, through your Son, and the warnings that you give to pastors to remain faithful, to, as Jude said, keeping ourselves in the love of God always and not letting our feet slip because we are standing on a solid place on you. And even though we can be smashed into by the world, by people who don't like you or hate you or don't understand you, by the powers and pressures that want us to be more like the world and less like you, to make them more comfortable, Lord, I pray that you would keep us as your comforters. The conduit of your Holy Spirit to this world, to give this world hope always. And when pressure does come, for us to stand, not arrogantly, but simply on you, that we would continue to be that spout where your glory comes out to everyone around us as pleasing children of you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.